Hey guys, it is June the 14th and it's kind of a mixed day when I look at what I'm seeing, but I think the market is reading very red. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here really quick. Past performance is not indicative of future returns as we always love, love, love to say. And, um, you know, I got just want to show you the how, why I'm saying it's mixed. You've got the S&P 500 dancing around flat today. Like it was actually up at one point. The Dow, the Russell down quite a bit. Crude recovering from yesterday because let's just face it, doesn't matter what the market does right now. Oil prices are going up. Let's just call it what it is, right? And so, and then you've got NASDAQ up a bit, but really um, depends on the minute that you check the tape. Because, you know, I'm sure I could refresh this by the end of the call and you'd see it flat, maybe up a lot. It's hard to say. But what I would say is when you then look at who's up, who's down, which I always think is really important to do, you can see that um, quite a lot of industries, like it's just kind of random. Like why would Procter & Gamble be down four in particular? There are kind of one-off news items on the tape today, but are they the end-all be-all? Do they really impact um, in a meaningful way, it's really fascinating um, how things are doing what they're doing. I am going to talk about Oracle today, and I am going to also talk about FedEx briefly. I don't have positions in either, unfortunately, um, given how aggressively they're up. But I do think that they are very telling of what you can anticipate to happen within large cap land. Um, and yeah, so we're going to talk about it. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that we do have a bunch of stuff coming out tomorrow. You've got retail sales. You've got the FOMC meeting. That is putting a lot of volatility. The retail sales number is putting a lot of volatility into the retail names today. I mean, it's a good, it's, it's, it's a big question mark. You know, the big, if we were to always talk about the markets, like it's some kind of Netflix show for, that we are going to get commercials on, like if there were commercials on what's the market going to do tomorrow, the commercial for the retail sales number is, hey, did people spend money or is gas and all of those things creating such a headwind that people aren't even buying the things that you'd anticipate them to buy on what is ultimately still reopening? I mean, people are still figuring it out as relates to going back to work, et cetera. Um, I will admit that the one retail play that I have, I have bought into what the fundamental folks are saying on Kohl's, but the way that I'm doing it is to acquire my Kohl's using the excessive volatility that's a name a bit lower, that's in the name a bit lower. And I want to kind of show you what I'm looking at that might be relevant. Of course, we have a whole slew of names that really it's unfortunate they're all on the same day because any one of these is actually pretty relevant in the current marketplace. Import price index, that's very relevant because we do anticipate with the strong dollar, or at least we here at Garula anticipate with the strong dollar that you are gonna get benefit from the fact that that strength necessarily carries into us holding up everybody else by them wanting our dollars in reserve and wanting to sell to us at prices that ultimately mean that um, we are gonna get some inflationary benefit on everything except for food and energy, okay? There's like nothing to help us with food from here until the end of the year, except for mother nature. And there is nothing to help us with energy per se through the summer months, except for mother nature. So those things cannot change. And I think that's why every single time you get a chance on a, on a red day, you should look very carefully at the energy names that you think are still very cheap, not the ones that are expensive. And you should take some exposure there, buy some, because this is a multi-year situation. You think about how many people are releasing their oil stock right now, unless you believe strongly, I mean, you got to believe so strong too, that the movement to EV is going to happen faster than the three years that it would take to even remotely build um, capacity upwards for any of these countries, unless you believe that then essentially what's happened is at the governmental level for most countries, they have, almost every single government has released its store of energies. They got to buy it back at some point because it's just dangerous not to have any, right, for the next three years. I mean, maybe not, who knows, but 
I mean, I watched a lot of Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat. It seemed like that's what the Pharaoh would do. So that's all I'm saying. Okay. And then you've got industrial production at the end, but I think this um, market volatility is going to continue. It's going to be really hard to come in here and buy it, except for this. Now, there are a few exceptions, and I really want to make sure you understand what it is we're seeing. FedEx trades at like eight times earnings, okay? Even after today's crazy move, the investor told them to issue, uh, the activist investor told them to issue a dividend. What's happening is that last mile is a real thing. Logistic build is a real thing. People are absolutely, the trend of, um, of, um, of buying things instead of going to the store, even though we are seeing the retailers do fantastically, particularly if they're big box retailers that offer multiple things that you can buy, um, the revenue numbers are still very strong. But nonetheless, FedEx has been able to get pricing through, et cetera, so it trades at single digits, despite the fact that it is not growing at single digits. Now, I find it the wrong call, in my opinion, for the activist investor to request dividends. I think actually in this particular market environment, you'd rather have a company that buys back stock because essentially you're going to be able to buy back your own stock at prices that make zero cents from a long-term growth perspective. And I would have preferred that the activists be in that area, but for whatever reason, I get it. And this is something that Wall Street will eventually have to work itself out. All these activists that are in theory working for investors, if what you're doing as an activist is just trying to generate more cash flow for yourself and for your investors, I think you're a little bit full of it because it means that you're not necessarily trying to help the company I'm just saying, because in this environment, between buying back stock and giving a dividend so that I, the investor, can have more cash flow, I'd rather not have the cash. I'd rather have you buy back stock and just see the appreciation from the fact that you are actually one of the few companies growing. Now, can I dividend reinvest? Sure, but you're just throwing off cash. So I actually don't think that's the right call. But hey, this is an age-old question among equity investors. It is what it is. Realize, though, that that does mean that any company that has a ton of cash flow is going to just be benefit is going to benefit in this environment because they're going to be beholden to these guys who are basically taking the cash flow from another com company and therefore increasing their own warehouse and war chest of cash flow and they're going to be able to buy other companies with it which by the way in case you guys are confused as to what it is that Warren Buffett does um, Warren Buffett does it but in a way that I think is a lot more fair to the shareholder in other words he takes your whole company in right? So that, so that you aren't beholden to the swings of the entire market. Like that's what he typically does, or it becomes the single largest shareholder. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's a little bit different than some rando XYZ activist. That's why I think Warren Buffett, I'm always a little bit more of a fan of, despite the fact that there are haters. Hey, you know what? We could take that offline, or you can come on my Discord and yell at me all you want, or you can come on my call and yell at me all you want. I don't care, but it's a little bit different. Um, to take a company private and allow it to not be beholden to the nuances of the marketplace and allow it to really generate that cash flow in an amazing way versus this, which is still a very public company that probably would be doing better to use that cash to support the stock at eight times earnings, given that you're growing at 24. But hey, you know what? You're allowed. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. <laughs> now, Oracle, I would mention as well, this one is one to really kind of watch, not because I think that you should get into Oracle. I'm not either negative nor positive, so I am not participating in Oracle in the near term, but it does indicate something else that one has to be aware of. And that is that if you beat up a stock beyond what makes any sense and the company actually is doing something for growth for the future, you may, it may be the wrong move for the shorts to do that. And with Oracle, look, it's still not necessary. Look, cash flow, awesome metric. Earnings, not so much. We're going to have to see it in the next two quarters. But it's possible that they've turned this baby around because you are seeing the, the thing with this is that you had to kind of move from the cloud business versus the non cloud business. The cloud business is now finally showing signs of actually growing to be large enough to completely offset all the nonsense of the old business, which is the old composite Oracle business server, et cetera. And it's doing it 
<laughs> you're going to laugh because the cloud business is cheaper from an energy perspective, which has its own nuances. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they're telling the story like champs because someone will ultimately eat the cost of those server businesses, just that Oracle is not like not going to be the one to do it, given that they're moving to cloud. I'll give you a clue as to who's doing it. It's whoever owns a cloud business. Right, but whatever. Okay, that's another thing. But like, um, it, it regardless. The point is, is that they are starting to turn it a bit, and in that regard, um, it's really you know, if you look at the earnings, the earnings look ugly because they still is a fair amount of reinvestment. Whether or not they can keep that growth going, um, that is again how you would do the commercial for this company and what you would expect next quarter. I think uh, there are other companies that are more interesting for me personally in this environment, but it doesn't mean that this is like, I'm neither positive nor negative this, and I may live to regret that because there are definitely going to be some people that make money on it today. And so I think when you take these two and composite, it really does suggest that if you are a value investor right now, you would be very, very wise to look through and see name by name what's interesting. In contrast, if you're going to do it via the ETFs and the indices, you will not get the upside that you want because a lot of those have those value things are questionably doing it, you know, in a way that's truly eliciting value, right? So, for example, company, you know, it a lot of these value indices are PE based. Well, PE based doesn't tell you that a company is value because PE and cash flow have nothing to do with each other as metrics. I mean, they do. Don't get me wrong for all the fundamental people look at this and get upset, but a company can have massive growth in cash flow and still show a negative PE. Um, and yeah, good luck to you on that. Um, we absolutely do do that work here. Most of the companies that I have been positive on have mad sick growing cash flow because of the nature of it. That is by for, you know, it's all the areas. So, I mean, I don't even have to be that clever. The fact is, if you're in fertilizer right now, you have mad sick, crazy cash flow. If you're in energy right now, you have mad sick, crazy cash flow way above any kind of cost that you're going to have. It turns out though, for those two, you'll also have mad sick, crazy earnings, but there's a lot of other places where that's the case. I was looking at um, Kohl's today because I know that's becoming its own little special meme. I'm late to it for sure. But the fact is they've got a bunch of stuff that they're legitimately turning around. This Sephora thing pro does absolutely promise to be very beneficial to um, traffic, store traffic, right? Then you also benefit from the fact that gasoline prices are so high that people will shop locally versus going farther um, for certain items. And I think she's got a chance of turning this thing around. So given where it even trades on an earnings best basis, let alone cash flow basis, and given how high the vol is, there are ways to recreate this 10%, even 20% lower using the options market by selling puts. Again, if you don't have a meaningfully sized account, you don't sell puts. I'm just going to tell you that flat out. Don't do it. Don't try to do it. Don't think you can do it. And it's okay. It's not. But if you've got like a bigger account where you can do a little bit here. I would sell puts on, on Kohl's. It's not going to zero at this point. She's absolutely stabilized that business. And on top of it, if anything, your bias is up. And even if you're concerned, the cash flow is higher and she's got a billion dollars of stock that she's allowed to buy back as well. So it's kind of a joke there as well. Anyways, with that, I'll go ahead and hit this stop share and we'll take some questions and then maybe get back to it. Because really, I mean, with FMC tomorrow, let's just talk about what it is. <laughs> That's really what matters. Um, uh, Matt, you, you've, been, you've been bullish oil for months and months. Yeah, since it was, since you originally, uh, Biden it was, thought he, what's you originally it? based it on a supply issue, right? Mm -hmm. Recently? Well, no, 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 months ago. Oh yeah, no. Look, I, I've been the thing that really made it an easy is I mean, there were some people that took exposure even earlier than I did. I think it, where we the, where this originated was when uh, President Biden attempted to lower the price of oil when it was in the 80s in November of last year by uh, releasing reserves into the December month. And I was like, good try at that. We still have to get through yeah, winter. You, you, you know were <laughs> That's not going to actually do anything. Your yeah, little you, you were yeah. bullish before. You were bullish before that. The point I'm trying to make is now it's turning into a, a demand issue because yes. Okay, so demand and low supply. That's I mean it really could take off from this point. 
Yeah. I mean, I think I'd rather have the equities and, you know, I've talked about this. I'd rather have the equities than the commodities. I think the commodities are going to be all over the freaking map. And I honestly wouldn't even know how to trade it. I think it's really scary, but the day traders, you know, more love to you. You could probably make a lot of money in oil because in fairness, until we get some sense for what's going to happen in six months, whatever, that entire curve is a big ass question mark watch my language, right? Like where, you know, 122 front month spot. Okay. We know there's only two weeks left. That's probably what people are paying. But if we're going to go to December, you're really dependent to, to know whether or not that is overpriced or underpriced is hundred percent based on whether or not they were able to switch up the projects that have Russia involved to projects that don't have Russia involved and how fast that was able to be done at what rate. That's a big question mark. Additionally, all this idea that we know exactly where the oil is, so increasing ENP is just like, you know, set it and forget it, or like something like we could dial up Amazon Prime. You know, it's called exploration, which is a question mark and reduction for a reason, right? You got to find it and confirm that it's there first. And, you know, some of it, yeah, it's just, it's just switching on, uh, flipping on the switch and creating production, but you got to actually explore, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, and I think uh, it looks to me like oil companies are not exploring as aggressively as they once mm. would. At well, with prices this high, they're generating so much cash. Th then they would return that to shareholders, like Devon, for example, and that makes the stock even more attractive. Right? Yes. That's why I like Devin even more than I like the majors. A lot of people are swimming into the majors, Exxon Mobil, et cetera. And I get it. I, that's fine. I understand it. All of them should benefit in this, right? But um, us on the onshore folks, that's unambiguous. And in a market like this, I like unambiguous. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I don't like, ooh, I don't know. How's it going to go? Which way? In fairness, I think all of them will do fantastic. So it's not like I'm out there shortened like crazy, you know, and, and doing some kind of pair up. No, um, I like my little happy 7% dividend yield on Devin, which will necessarily go up in the next quarter. I mean, what are they really going to do in this next quarter? Buy back stock. Ooh, confusing. You know what I mean? And, and, and raise the dividend. So, you know, I like it whether you own the equity outright or whether you, you know, um, yeah, that's, that's another, why. Another point you made is, and this is not cyclical. This is going to mean, I mean, oil could be high for a long, long time. Yeah. I mean, it depends how you think about cycle, right? If we're going to giggle about this a little bit since we. Well, it's since not short term. So. There, yeah, it's not a like one quarter cycle or one year cycle. You realize these countries still have to re up their reserves, even if we go to EV. Do you know what I'm saying? Even if the whole world uh, is somehow, I mean, and it's really honestly, it's not even like um, if we go to electric vehicles, we reduce dramatically. You still got airplanes, you know what I'm saying? You still got uh, utilities Plastic. companies. What's that? Plastic. Plastic. Yeah, you still got tons of stuff that's got to happen. I mean, you think right now, you know, industrial production is going to be a big question mark. A lot of people are hitting the pause button on that, right? But um, ultimately, you know, there's this thing called wear and tear that happens on stuff. Do you know what I mean, so what's going to happen on either side of this if it's not a bunch of plastic being made? You know, you've got at least a good solid year to two years on this trade alone before we start to really figure out whether or not what's going to happen long term. I mean, the only thing that could actually be beneficial is the one thing no one wants to do, which is actually transition this world to nuclear. That's the one thing. As much as people want to think that all these green energy things are going to help us out, I mean... If you want to hold a negative population growth, maybe, but like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Mm -mm, you know, nuclear is the only thing that would actually help society. And we're still at a point where people aren't believing it's going to, that that's okay. Right, right. Okay, next question. Do you, I mean, yes, the Fed's raising rates. Yes, the Fed's behind the curve. But the market runs on multiples in the long run. Yeah. So do you think multiples will collapse? I mean, FedEx didn't. Oracle didn't. I mean. It's a big question mark. Okay. So on this one, I think that you have to be really careful where you put your, uh, it's really going to be a fundamental world. Like hopefully some of these analysts stop doing what I call lazy analytics and actually start doing fundamental work. Um, uh, but I think I, here's, here's what it looks like to me. It looks like the U S economy 
we won't know until June how bad all this GDP stuff really is. Okay. I think that it's going to end up. I, I, do I think we're in a recession? I think we're going to end up flat. And I think the 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 one industry that has to become a larger part of the S&P 500 is going to be um, energy, period, right? Energy has got to become a bigger part of the S&P 500 and also basic materials because we're going to have to grow, literally grow our way out of this situation. And it's not because we need to grow because fiscal policy, la, la, la. No, we got to grow because we got to transition the U.S. during the small window that we have where everybody else is a little bit crippled and we are not, right? We're going to have to build some things that actually allow long-term GDP growth for this nation, period. And the things that are going to allow long-term GDP growth for this nation are infrastructure. That's how I see what's actually happening. And strangely enough, the one good thing, as much as every 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 conservative out there is really upset about it but truly and, and and correctly the one good thing that congress was able to get through before the wheels fell off on inflation is this infrastructure bill and we need it because we've got problems in the united states hopefully that infrastructure bill will will be applied you know knock on wood in a way that allows us to grow gdp growth if anybody's confused about whether what this playbook is this is a playbook out of the the chinese playbook right they had the worst possible situation coming in when Deng Xiaoping took office. And what they do? They grew their way out of it, but they didn't grow their out, way out of it in a dumb way. They built a bunch of stuff that lowers their costs, period, right? They, there's a reason why they had no nuclear power plants pre-2000. Now they got the third most power plants in the world because they were trying to manage their energy costs so that they can make it cheaper to do stuff in China versus here. And guess what? They're still doing it. If we're confused, you know, you just take yourself a look. Look, it's not even China that you got to ask. It's the I, IEA could, tracks that stuff and where the builds are in nuclear power plants. So, you know, we have to do the things that will help our nation long term. We got an infrastructure bill that's going to allow us to do it for, for better or for worse. OK, now the, the range of inflation that will happen between then and now is a big question mark. GDP is a big question mark, even for me. Uh, but um yeah, I've gone on my tirade long enough. <laughs> Let me stop for a second. Let's put, next question. Um, this whole supply chain thing, don't you think we will be less dependent on foreign imports than before? I hope so. I, I, I semi semiconductors. Yeah, with semiconductors, you know, there's the thing is that um, Intel came out and said some crazy things. And I'm going to really have to listen to the call because that really bummed me out that it said the things that it said. Um, but yes, we will be less dependent on foreign uh, countries for it, except for the highest of high end. The highest of high end, we're still going to be trying to figure that out. Um, hopefully innovation, by having the fabs here, it brings innovation onshore more aggressively. And so this is a two or three year situation versus forever we're, we're dependent. But if we're gonna have a better seat at the table, um, let's say in global um, in, in global trade, we are gonna have to fix the semi, semi issue, right? Because, um, yes. And 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 that just is what it is. But that's a two to three year thing. Who that benefits and which companies are winners and losers. I was thinking Intel had a shot, but you know they came out like champs and suggested that things aren't going to be as good or as fast or whatever. And I need to better understand why he feels that way after being so bullish and and in the long term plan here. Now the other thing I would say is that if you're a CEO and there's articles that are coming out saying the CEOs are negative and la 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 all this stuff, um, I think that it's smart to guide downwards because the back half is unknown. We don't know where it's going to take us, et cetera. So probably the right move as a CEO, but depending on how you say it, I am going to short your stock. Like just FYI, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like if you say it in a way that is like crazy, such that I think you're not going to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that might present themselves in the back half of the year, then yeah, I'm going to short you, JP Morgan, right? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because someone else, essentially what you're telling me is someone else is going to come in and, and, and eat your eat your lunch. And you're going to let them because you're just too afraid. Fine. But there's other ways that you can say that message where I feel very hopeful that you're going to take that opportunity to, to flip it up, like Oracle, quite frankly. But again, um, the back half is unknown. Oracle is cheap, but it's not the cheapest it's ever been. Do you know what I mean? So, so that's where I kind of stand out there. Um, but the back half is unknown. That's what makes this game so fun, right? <laughs> you mean the back half of this year? This year, yeah. Okay. 
All we know is that there is a ton of capital out there that has not been deployed. Do you know what I mean? Right. Even the investment houses, as much as you're hearing a few blow up every now and then, largely speaking, there is just a lot of cash on the sidelines. That is why, um, whereas you know that my bread and butter, my, my joy has always been large cap, even I'm digging around in small cap land. Because if, if small, right? Because if small cat is going to get clobbered because they, quite frankly, don't have the balance sheet to support the growth vision uh, that they have, then large cap's going to come in and buy that growth at a, at a reasonable price. Right. That's what Apple does. Absolutely. All your strongest players are going to do it. Why? Because it's fun for them. They're not thinking like one year horizon, like the, like the day traders are. They're like, hey, who can I pick up at, at, on the cheap? who's tired of fighting the good fight and doesn't want to deal with the back half of the year and wants to come in away from the storm. Cause there's, I mean, storm coming or not, it's not fun to be a CEO in a negative GDP environment. If you're a startup that's been trying to run as fast as you can. Yep. That's right. Yeah. So my favorite place to look for it right now is healthcare because it's already been brutalized and not a, not a one of these COVID rich cash companies has said anything other than we will buy growth. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? so, I mean, if you've done, if you already told me, Hey, I will buy growth, then gives me a real hint as to where I want to look for growth. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, and almost every single one of these small cap companies that is meaningful, I'm looking for essentially companies that have a really good patent that someone would gladly buy and that their real issue is distribution, which not a one of the big pharma companies has a problem with distribution. And guess what? It turns out all the big cap farmers are also better at getting your thing, any kind of uh, any kind of trial that you're in, uh, through the FDA faster. That's that's yeah. what a big cap. You know, let's let's just like we could pretend like it all goes through the FDA in a very democratic, meritocratic way. But I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll be the first to scream bullshit on that. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. like, I'm sure that's sadly true. Yeah. So, so that's what I'm looking for these days. Cause I feel like that's the best use of my time. And then just um, managing my hedges when the market decides it wants to be red uh, on a bunch of companies that are clearly going to be making lots of money this year. <laughs> you know? Anyway. Right. right. Yeah. Um, one more thing. I mean, yeah, what you got? I mean, the, they, everybody says he's been so far behind the curve. I mean, on what? behind the curve as far as inflation the fed yeah i know i think you know you know he's one of my really favorite people. that no i don't want to say ignorant I, head in the sand i mean look here's the thing you can talk about this else? i don't what? think he, yeah i'm with you i don't think he's head in the sand i think it's i think people simplify his job a lot they're like oh he should just raise inflation 200 base points something nonsensical that will absolutely jog the entire front half of the market. I'm, you know, we, we have that video that we have put out just to describe very clearly how raising rates on the front end impacts specifically small and mid-sized businesses, but anyone that's going to use factoring as a means of, uh, of, um, of um, dealing with, with the supply chain. So I think that he's doing exactly what he should do in a moderated way. It turns out that the front end is now a little bit steeper. So 50 basis points is fine versus 25 basis points, but you got to watch that front end of the curve because you do not want to mess up funding that people absolutely need by, by inverting the front part of the curve. That's just dumb. And I don't, I don't see our fed chairman as a dumb man. I see him as incredibly intelligent, incredibly competent. Um, probably we are fortunate uh, even though I've had some people get in my face about the fact that he's not an economist, so he doesn't understand whatever, because technically he didn't he didn't grow up in the world of economy, the like academia. But I'm like, look, if you're going to play like this man isn't one of the best economists that's had the seat in the chair, then you got real nerve, for lack of a better way to say it. Do you know what I mean? Because he yeah, seems Bernanke, to appreciate Bernanke, modern Bernanke, monetary economic Bernanke, theory better than Bernanke, the academic. Bernanke, is Bernanke, Bernanke was academia too. Yeah, was non academic or academic? He, he was. He was academic. Yeah, and unfortunately, he flattened that curve out so many times that, the, <laughs> the, you know what I mean? In the dumbest possible way, multiple times, because like it, there wasn't any need to do it. But you know what? People love Bernanke, people love all these people. And I would say, just uh, realize again, over and over again, I'll say it till I'm blue in the face, raising rates does not change 
uh, the amount of food that is produced or the amount of energy um, that is produced. It can impact consumption, um, but you know, stagflation is dumb, okay? <laughs> stagflation is unnecessary in many ways. Um, it, there is no benefit, there is no long-term benefit to stagflation. If anything, all it does is make people very scared to do business. Um, and it has a, a, a unwinding effect that is really stupid, for lack of a better way, for lack of a more creative adjective. So I think that to the extent that our Fed chairman is being very thoughtful in how he would like to apply the brakes on inflation, I'm a fan and I will always be a fan. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, well put. Okay, well, we will see you tomorrow. Great show, Amy. All right, take care, guys. Bye. Good luck out there.